Kia ora, no mai haere mai everyone. Please forgive our um, technical hiccups at this end. We're trying something new with the lobby um, mechanism today, and I think it was maybe a mistake. We won't do it again. <laughs> Very nice to have you all with us, though. Um, my name's Joanne Dow. I'm Principal Engagement Advisor at Manaki Whenua. Thank you for joining us today. Um, so artificial intelligence is clearly a hot topic. It seems to be just about everywhere around us. Um, and as noted in the invitation, you know, district planning and uh, urban planning and land use um, design is no exception to this at all. Um, today's topic is looking specifically at how generative AI can be used by people who want to envisage future landscapes. It's clearly a topic of particular interest to planners, as witnessed by the New Zealand Planning Institute, who held a two-day workshop last week for planners, specifically kind of delving more into the use of this powerful technology for their work. So we're really pleased and excited to have um, our presenter with us today, David Warden, who is an environmental economist based in Tamaki Makoto, Auckland. David's primary research has um, his primary research interests are in technology adoption, infrastructure, economics, and survey analysis. He's been at Manaki Whenua for the last two years, and his most recent work here has been focused in this area, which is really all around understanding the risks and benefits of generative AI adoption for environmental research. Previously, um, David worked on issues such as biotechnology adoption and rural broadband affordability at the University of Guelph in Canada. So he's clearly got a broad array of interests and it's fantastic that, um, that we're going to get to hear from him today. I'll hand over to David very shortly, but just before I do, a, a few quick notes. Um, we'll be using Mentimeter today to, to receive and kind of sort through the questions. Um, so it's easy to use if you haven't used it before. Just go to www.menti.com and enter the code, which I'll put in the chat shortly rather than saying it now. Um, the Q&A function is also available if you'd prefer to use that, but the audience cameras and audio are, are turned off today. If you have any technical difficulty, it's best to, to message me directly while David is presenting. Um, and please do put all your questions in Mentimeter or in the Q&A function as David is talking. We probably won't get time to answer all of the questions today because we've only got half an hour, but as always, we will follow up with written responses to any of the questions that go unanswered today. So please keep them coming. Let's make the most of this opportunity. Um, with that, David, I will hand over to you and turn my camera off. I'll see you at the end. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks. Thanks, Joanne. And Kira Koto, so nice to see that so many of you have been able to join us this morning. Um, so as Joanne mentioned uh, in this project, this was kind of a proof of concept project, looking at the ability of generative AI tools to create imagery and using that for that kind of conceptualization brainstorming phase um, internally. So, you know, potentially with staff who are urban designers, landscape architects, um, planners and policy folks. And then also whether these images are of a high enough quality to be used for um, outreach and communication purposes, so extending that to a public audience. Um, this project was funded through MB's uh, Strategic Science Investment Fund, um, and it came off the back of an earlier survey that we had done where we were trying to assess uh, kind of these use cases using generative AI, so how generative AI could be used in ecological and environmental research. And my perspective as a, an environmental economist who's interested in technology adoption, um, I'm not an ecologist, my perspective is looking at the technology itself and trying to see how useful it is, what are the risks, what are the benefits, um, why would researchers choose to use and adopt this technology or not adopt it. So in this earlier survey that we ran, um, one of the use cases that came out of that was uh, imagery. So we were comparing kind of human content, human created images with generative AI imagery. And we found that generative AI imagery could actually hold quite a bit of real value 
um, for that kind of conceptualization and communication and outreach functions. So um, yeah, that's how this project came about. We decided to delve a little deeper into this use case and see what, uh, yeah, see what we found basically. So what are generative AI image creation tools? Um, so by this point, most of you are, are likely aware of generative AI and where you've probably heard the most about it is in terms of ChatGPT. So that was the tool that um, kind of took the uh, news media by storm and everybody talked about adoption of Gen AI through the lens of talking about ChatGPT. And up until just recently, ChatGPT um, worked by having a user, a user would enter a text prompt and then ChatGPT would respond. So you would ask ChatGPT a question about something and it would give you a text response back. The way generative AI image creation tools work is that you enter that same, you know, you would enter a text prompt still, but it will generate an image for you. Rather than responding with more text, it will generate an image of what you'd like to see. So in this project, we used a tool called Midjourney. Um, and on the screen here, you can see a, a screen grab from within Midjourney. So uh, in this image, I've kind of broken down this image in, in three layers, the foreground, middle ground, and background. And it's supposed to be trying to capture the idea and the kind of feeling of what Ototahi Christchurch looks like. So it's depicting this kind of residential area and um, being reminded to ground this um, in, in uh, Ototahi Christchurch area. So this in contrast to kind of the status quo technology, um, which I would say is, is Photoshop or other image generation and editing tools, um, typically that and, and that still has quite a bit of value. It still is more accurate to meeting the needs um, in certain contexts, but it can be very labor intensive to have someone work through Photoshop, um, time and labor intensive. And it also can be um, quite expensive if you're talking about generating a lot of images. Whereas our argument and something we were looking into with Midjourney and other Gen AI image creation tools is whether it could kind of reduce the costs and speed up some of that um, yeah, image creation and and thinking about future scenarios for land use. So when I talk about um, future scenarios for land use planning, maybe I'll just skip to the next slide here and, and give you an example. So it's the originally it's the same image that you saw on the previous slide, but you can see here through this animated GIF that we're now editing through these iterations of different land use um, planning decisions. So these hypothetical future scenarios where we say, you know, on this kind of peri-urban buffer. What, what could this look like, right? You could see more active transport and kind of green space boundaries. You could see more pasture or sports fields. You could see increasing um, urban development, so higher density housing, for example, or you could be seeing uh, wetland restoration or something like that, right? So it's it's this idea in the in this project, we were really interested in seeing, you know, how how far has this technology come? How far can we push it to try to think about conceptualizing these future alternate land use scenarios? But of course, um, as I'm sure many of you are aware, especially if you've played around with generative AI like um, ChatGPT or if you've used image generation tools as well, um, they're not perfect. Uh, you frequently get uh, interesting little errors. Um, for example, in these two images on your screen, um, I, th I believe when I was making these images, I was prompting for you know three, three mountain bikers um, in the Port Hills or something like that. So the left image, uh, you know, at least to my eye, from my perspective, um, the left image is, is pretty good. It looks, you know, fairly realistic. It feels like it's kind of capturing that landscape well. Um, and then the right image is, you know, again, to my perspective, you might like it stylistically or whatever, but the right image is maybe not doing such a good job. Um, you can see, I, you know, I'm not a great mountain biker by any stretch, but there are some unconventional cycling techniques being utilized in this image. And this is something that we're really interested in understanding with this technology of of where does it kind of hit hurdles or stumbling blocks? Where does it fall over and and how how can you kind of get around that? Where are some prompting techniques that you can use when you're using this technology to get beyond those those issues and, and create an image that's actually beneficial where you know the benefits of creating it outweigh the, the risks or the costs or or whatever. So to assess this, um, we were very fortunate to have the support of Selwyn District Council and the Greater Christchurch Partnership. Um, we in in previous discussions with them, we had been talking about 
trying to find a, a real world case study where we could trial this technology and see how useful it actually was for council staff. And um, yeah, we were very lucky to, to stumble across this um, option with Greater Christchurch Partnership and Solid District Council where they were interested in thinking about green belt designs within the city and on the on the periphery. So um, yeah, we looked at three different areas within Greater Christchurch and we used those as our kind of case study to look at green belt designs and talk about how useful the imagery from that exercise is. So attendees included um, planners, urban designers, uh, policy people, landscape architects, that type of um, that type of group. And yeah, as I say, we were just very interested in hearing from them about ideas and designs that they would like to see visualized. And then in the follow up workshop that we ran, um, we then went and assessed how good those images actually were for the, the task at hand. So yeah, as I mentioned, um, three different locations were selected within Greater Christchurch. We chose these particular locations because we had quite good ecological modeling. So our kind of baseline data of these areas was quite good. So we felt confident um, being able to assess the quality of these future images against what the current baseline looks like. So um, as I mentioned, three of them, Marshlands, Prebleton, and Port Hills. And I also want to make it very clear, very, very clear at this point, um, these locations and designs were solely for discussion brainstorming purposes. Um, they're not indicative of any planned design or projects in the future. So one of the big concerns with uh, generative AI image creation that you kind of like what you would have seen in that image I showed of the cyclists and the mountain bikers is that it can, uh, it quite easily can get separated from reality. So it, it's very easy to make images that um, don't look particularly realistic or don't seem particularly tied to the context that you're interested in. So we really focused in this um, project on establishing how you tie those images back to the real world. So how do you keep them grounded so that it still feels tangible to the people living and working in those communities? Um, and how do you make sure that when you're then extrapolating or thinking about future scenarios, that it still feels like it it could be realistic, like it could be something that you would actually see in the future. So here's one example um, data that we had for marshlands when I speak about that kind of ecological baseline data. It's just having that kind of good sense of, you know, tree canopy cover, what runoff retention looks like. Those types of factors that help us inform sort of what the current land use um, is approximately. And then going from there, we can we can generate the images. Here's another example of a way that we we tie these images back to reality. So um, the two images on the left hand side of the screen, those are from Google Earth. Um, so yeah, you can read the little text description there of where that is, but um, just near Prebleton. And the focus here on using this kind of bird's eye view through Google's or Google Earth is to um, capture kind of the attributes and the makeup of the land. Similar to what I was mentioning earlier, it's it's trying to capture the feeling of what the distribution of land use looks like in an area. And then we blend those images together using um, the Gen AI tool, MidJourney, to create this image on the right. So that's kind of representative of our baseline status quo type image. And one other quick thing that I'll just mention about the technology in another way that's, that it is kind of powerful um, is that it gives you this flexibility to look at a kind of range of styles in a way and a range of presenting visual information um, going from, you know, kind of that aerial photographic type view to things that are kind of more bird's eye and they could be conceptual or kind of artistic looking um, and then right down to, you know, the kind of street level design type feature stuff. So, as I mentioned, um, we did run workshops with Cell and District Council and the Greater Christchurch Partnership. We ran two separate workshops in March of this year. And in the first one, we brought people together to ask them, um, you know, we, we had these three locations in mind and we asked them about potential designs that they would like to see. And people gave us those ideas. We kind of summarized them up, collated them, went away, made all the images. And then in the second workshop, we brought everyone together to then discuss those images, see how well they thought they were doing. So in this slide, you can see two images representing a hypothetical scenario where you have a new residential development, but you also want to increase the wetland integration and restoration at the same time. So the idea here in this image is that you can see kind of a new style of development there. Um, with this integration of, of uh, you know, stormwater and, and wetland restoration. So 
this this particular example, we have these kind of two perspectives, this bird's eye view, and then more of a closer kind of street level design concept. Um, overall, people thought, and I can show you on the next slide here, when we go and ask people what they think of this, now granted, small workshop, um, so we, you know, we're asking a group of 10 people what they think of these, but overall people think they're fairly useful. They could be useful for that kind of brainstorming conceptualization phase, so talking internally, and then um, also potentially for, for public outreach. Some of the criticisms of these images, um, especially if I go back just for a second, you can see in detail, um, people spoke about the design of these um, houses looking maybe potentially quite North American, which likely reflects the training data that was used in Midjourney. So Midjourney is pulling from library, a library of images, um, and it's likely that quite a few of those images, when they think about residential and houses, um, they think about you know images that are based in North America. And then also, you know, if you look, you know, if you have kids, you might look at this and say, oh, uh, in terms of the safety and the Tamariki there that we see, um, maybe there are some questions as well, right? So trying to highlight that these images aren't perfect, but they might serve a purpose and a value in being able to, you know, allow like these images can be generated in about 60 seconds and you can put in a description. So you could be having a internal discussion, a brainstorming session. You could say, well, what? you know, paint a picture for me, what would that look like? And you generate the image and then it kind of gives you that reference point and that way to start talking about different attributes that you might want to change or, you know, different concerns that you have, that type of thing. So, yeah, as I mentioned, in general, people thought these two images were fairly useful for that idea. And then another one that we looked at, another um, example was in the Port Hills. So we conducted these workshops in March. The Port Hills fires um, took place in February. So it was front of mind, the, the kind of tragedy and the concern around that was front of mind for people at the time. So we thought about the idea of this kind of staged implementation of a restoration project, but also incorporating um, a fire resistant design at the same time. So as you can see here, this again is kind of highlighting some of the value that we think these generative AI tools have is that we can generate a, you know, more than one image. We can generate a few images quite quickly and show this kind of staged implementation of a project over time. So on the left hand side, you see quite a few exotic species. And the idea is that the exotic species are kind of phased out over time as you start to see more of these kind of stormwater ponds um, and native plant restoration. So you might for example, look at this image if you're critiquing it. One of the ones that came out of the workshop is people saying, you know, the Port Hills is quite dry, right? Where where does the where does the water and the runoff come from for these stormwater ponds? And that it's again a very valid concern. And my my focus and the focus of this project isn't to try to argue that these tools are perfect at all. It's to try to argue that they're useful tools for helping people to think through um, different design concepts, future thinking in terms of land use planning. And then it also is helpful in some contexts can be helpful to share with the public if you're trying to kind of encapsulate that um, that kind of picture is worth a thousand words type idea. So yeah, again, our small smallish sample size in the workshop, but still um, some decent agreement in terms of these images being useful both for the kind of council internal focus and then also for the public audience as well. The last set of images I'll show you here um, are two, two GIFs, two animations that we're running side by side. And when we put this up in the workshops, people had quite a strong reaction to seeing this type of imagery. So the left-hand side in particular, people had quite a strong reaction to seeing. Um, but we spoke about the value of that type of comparison, being able to compare images like this side by side, showing two quite different, two kind of opposed um, paths of the future. So one is showing increasing um, urbanization and, and residential sprawl. And then the other one is showing an effort to maintain that peri-urban buffer and increasing tree canopy. So this is trying to depict an area that's you know kind of looking towards the Port Hills. And um, when we asked uh, workshop attendees about this, you know, getting getting past that initial reaction where you look at this um, you know kind of scary future image. Um, people agreed that that could actually be quite a powerful communication tool when you're trying to express to people the value of, of thinking about green belts and thinking proactively about future land use planning so that you don't see this kind of, um, uh, yeah, the, the kind of incursion and, and the incremental sprawl and urbanization in this area. So, yeah, overall, we thought, 
you know, again, you can look at these images and and point out critiques, interesting things about the way the the kind of planning looks and the way roadways change and things like that over time. But overall, trying to capture that idea from that kind of upper level conceptual view of, you know, why do we care about green belts? Why is it important to be planning for this? Um, people thought it could be quite quite effective to use a tool like this. So what is next? As I mentioned, we had an earlier survey where we looked at use cases in generative AI, and then we ran this smaller kind of proof of concept project where we, um, yeah, assessed the image creation tools and kind of how valuable that was. The next things that that is uh, coming down the pipeline is that we have a smart ideas bid that recently got funded. Um, so this is focused on going, you know, much, much deeper, utilizing a suite of Gen AI tools and the ability of this technology to, um, you know, capture climate change adaptation information and tailor that and scale that to very location specific users. So we're in this context of this project, we're looking at farmers, council, Maori landowners, and we're really interested in understanding those end users and what their needs would be with this technology as well as the ethical adoption. Because uh, again, if you've been keeping up with the news media around generative AI, there are a lot of potential ethical concerns. So adoption needs to be carefully thought about and rather than rushed into. And um, if you are interested in learning more about this project um, and learning more about this generative AI platform that we're going to be um, developing for climate change adaptation, um, we do have an email address here at the bottom of the slide. So it's AI at landcareresearch.co.nz. And if you're interested, we will be eventually setting up a mailing list there. So you can um, just please send us an email, contact us there, and we'll get you um, set up on that mailing list. So thank you, everyone. Uh, thanks for attending. As I mentioned earlier, just really want to thank um, the Selwyn District Council and Greater Christchurch Partnership again. Um, they were very much instrumental in this project being able to take place. And then I also want to acknowledge uh, imagery in this. The vast majority of the images were developed in Midjourney version 6, but there were also images from Google Earth and then also Land Information New Zealand for those um, aerial images of uh, Greater Christchurch area. Thanks, everyone. And happy to take any questions as well. Kia ora. Thanks so much. David, that was a fascinating and fantastic whirlwind with some really powerful imagery there. Um, look, I apologise. I seem to have turned off the Mentimeter just at the last minute, though. So there's plenty of questions in there. Um, we definitely won't get through them all. If you still have more questions, please go ahead and use the Q&A function on, um, here on Teams. Um, look, there's yeah, there's quite a lot of questions. We're definitely not going to get through them all. So I'm going to take like um, moderator's license here and ask my question first, which is really around, is this going to replace the need for humans? Um, are we still going to need humans to do this work or is AI going to magic it all up for us? Yeah, I think um, my, my takeaway on this, I do think there's, I think people are very reasonable and being concerned about that. Um, from this particular project, at least, I would say it came out very clearly that you need the experts. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, I'm not an ecologist, so I don't have expertise in that. I'm not a planner, I'm not an urban designer. Um, it very much stood out to me as the one who was going away, making images, and then bringing them back to those audiences, that that expertise and the people who actually understand those working conditions, um, yeah, absolutely instrumental. So I don't see that being... Uh, uh, replaced anytime soon is my perspective on it. I think these are really tools that can help us to do work, um, but they don't do the work for us, if that makes sense. No, yeah, that makes sense. Um, but it would, yeah, obviously make us all more resource efficient, I suppose. Um, that is the hope. As, as the uh, as the dismal economist who thinks about costs and things like that. I, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Great, thank you. And now um, a commonly asked question, which should be an easy one. Did you use the free versions of the of the software, of the AI software mid-journey, or did you get a paid or subscription service? Yeah, that's a very good question. So currently, or at least when we were doing this project, there were kind of three main tools. Um, there was Dolly 2, and then it switched to Dolly 3, and that's built into ChatGPT. So if you use ChatGPT, you could go to it, ask it to make you an image. Um, the free version of that's quite limited in the number of images. 
There's also okay. a tool called Stable Diffusion, which is kind of more, um, what's the best way of putting it? You need a higher level of expertise to really be using that tool effectively. And then there's Mid Journey. And the reason we chose Mid Journey, although it is a paid subscription, so it is something you have to pay for, um, we argued that the photorealism, the quality of the images, and the user experience, that kind of ease of use, gave us probably the best tool to look at what images are actually likely to be seen going forward with people adopting this technology. And that's really what we were interested in. We didn't want something that was just only specific to us. We wanted something that was representative of the tool being used um, kind of en masse, if that makes sense. Yeah, OK, that definitely does make sense. OK. Um... Uh, I can see someone on the call has their hand up and the audio and cameras are turned off for this seminar. So if you've got a question, could you just pop it into the Q&A function um, or the chat in the sidelines there? Um, so I'm going to go with a question that's in the Q&A now because my Mentimeter screen is seems a bit blocked. Um, can your AI the AI be taught to learn more like other AI functions about, for example, mountain bikes, New Zealand versus North America and houses um, or rainfall received on the sites and so on? Yeah, I would say to some extent that is possible. So when I showed those earlier slides where we'd kind of taken the Google Earth imagery and we blended it, <clears throat> sorry, we blended it together to represent that kind of status quo of Prebleton. That is that kind of idea, right? We're trying to weight the training data that it's using towards a more realistic and more representative situation for what we're interested in. The issue to some extent is, as you can imagine, when you look at these images of landscapes, everyone's different kind of worldview, everyone's different expertise plays into that image. When I when I see an image, it'd be quite different to the experience that you have when you see it. You might notice something completely different, right? So it is a bit of that balance of, of what do you weight your training data towards? What do you focus on? And in the workshops, one thing that, um, you know, speaking with urban designers, one thing that they mentioned was that you might use these images to get you kind of 95% of the way towards what you want to depict. And then you might still have that person go into Photoshop and add those little attributes at the end that that kind of help, you know, illustrate what you're really focused on, right? Um, yeah. Yeah. Because I would say it, almost to some extent, each use case is a bit specific, right? You might want to highlight something and not highlight something else, um, depending on the context. Okay, yeah. And then kind of supplementary question from me, presumably, if you've got a subscription service, you're able to personalize and kind of specialize your your tool more for your local context as well. So you'll be able to train it more around the specific vegetational landscape features in the area that you're working in. Is that true or can you do that just as well with a free? Yeah, so tools like Stable Diffusion that I mentioned earlier is starting to do that. Um, it was kind of an interesting time to be doing this project because um, in the news media, there was a lot of concern about people doctoring photos and editing existing photos for misinformation and disinformation purposes, right? Yeah. So at the time, a lot of these um, software companies said that's too much of a risk. Um, so we're going to restrict the usage of people being able to edit photos. Mm -hmm. And that is part of the reason that we use this um, blending function rather than editing an existing aerial photo of an area. Um, there were the restrictions built into the software to limit misinformation meant that you had to be more creative in the way you thought about that. Um, okay. So if you, as I mentioned earlier, when we think about technology adoption, the risks are very important to talk about. And this is still a technology that's evolving rapidly almost every day. Midjourney has gone through two or three version changes since this project. And yeah. it's important to keep in mind that, you know, oh, yeah. when you're thinking about adoption, this is something that changes and is up to the whims sort of of the companies that own it. So, yeah. Great. Great. OK, look, there are so many more questions, but we're going to have to put you to work, David, answering those in writing yep. this week um, and getting them out to people because we have run out of time. So just. And then this still is a chance. Um, and the recording of the seminar, along with those questions, will be posted on our website 
probably within a few days and we'll send that link out to everyone who is registered to come along today. Um, just a note for those of you who are regular Link Online attendees, we're taking a short break over the summer, longish kind of spring summer, and we will be back in February with another seminar for you um, on the 7th of February. So in the meantime, um, take care, everyone. Enjoy your summer break as well. It's an early start for us. Thanks so much for joining us today. Um, and yes, if you haven't been able to ask something, the chat will still be, or the question and answer function will still be going in Teams. So yeah, so let us know. All right. Thanks so much, David. Nice yeah, to see thanks, you. Thanks, Joanne. Everyone. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Kia ora.